Okay, so this will be the last screencast video lecture for the unit on post-colonialism. And indeed, the last screencast video lecture for the semester, okay? And uh, so this lecture will consist of basically me reading post-colonialism 2, uh, which you should have already read before you watch this particular screencast video lecture. Uh, so I'll be reading from that. I'll be embroidering on some of the concepts, uh, perhaps. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just refer to the post-colonialism vocabulary exercise. So as you see here, uh, for a concept like post-colonialism or a definition of post-colonialism, what post-colonialism is or what post-colonial theory is, uh, I want you to refer to the first screencast video lecture that I did on post-colonialism. Uh, and same applies to the concept and the definition of colonialism and imperialism uh, and also colonialist ideology or discourse. I already uh, mentioned all of these, these concepts at length in the most recent post-colonialism screencast video lecture that I uploaded for y'all, okay? Now, the ones that are highlighted here, cultural colonization, othering, demonic other, exotic other, Eurocentrism, universalism, colonial subject, mimicry, nativism, otherwise known as nationalism, neocolonialism, uh, a concept that will be illustrated by Stephanie Black's documentary film, Life and Debt, and also canonical counter discourse. Uh, you can just simply refer to Lewis Tyson's chapter on post colonialism or post colonial criticism. Okay? Uh, although I will talk a little bit about uh, um, this concept of canonical counter discourse in this particular screencast video lecture after I talk about the connections, or relations between post-colonial theory or post-colonialism and deconstruction, okay? All right, so here we go. Post-colonialism two, more notes and reflections. So maybe some of y'all are interested in the question of uh, the connection between deconstruction and, and, and post-colonial theory. Uh, well, the, the connections are manifold or numerous and, and varied. Uh, let me, however, simplify by focusing on one connection. Uh, deconstruction is a theory and, and critical practice largely preoccupied with the relations between language and power. Deconstruction is sea language, its uses, its various meanings, as deeply reflective of power relations, you know, within and between societies. Uh, so if analyzed from a certain angle, language re represents how meaning has been historically constructed to create, maintain, and also reproduce the power and interests of the ruling class. That is, if you are a deconstructionist with Marxist leanings. So for example, Derrida, or Jacques Derrida, uh, the French philosopher, studies text. And I've spoken to you all about this uh, before. Uh, for example, literature, legal documents, law, the language of rights, philosophy, travel literature whereby Europeans represent or describe uh, or narrate their experiences with indigenous peoples, natives, etc. throughout the non-European world. 
Well, remember, the objects of his scholarship are extensive. He reads texts from various European nations or societies dating back to antiquity up to the contemporary moment, uh, sometimes referred to as modernity. And he has trained himself to see or discern or identify patterns in the varied heterogeneous texts he reads and interprets. And in many languages, mind you, okay, Derrida uh, knows uh, um, how to speak his, his native tongue of, uh, of French. He also speaks English, German. He's able to read Latin, Greek, uh, Spanish, and, and many other languages, but predominantly from, from Europe, okay? Uh, and he notes that language, which, if you recall, uh, he thinks of as non-referential, uh, which is a meaning that it refers not to things in and of themselves in all of their actual complexity, but to our concepts of, of things, phenomena, beings in the world, what have you. Uh, and you notice that language does follow a structure. That is, if we're thinking in broad historical terms, you know, he claims that European humanity generally thinks in terms of binary oppositions. This is very important uh, for post-colonial theory. You know, binary sets or oppositions always construct meaning by implicit or explicit contrast between terms with a culturally agreed upon set of positive connotations and terms with a negative set of connotations or associations within a given society or, or culture. Now, one term is always privileged with respect to its supposed opposite, whereas one term is exalted and idealized, which is to say understood to be superior or connoting superiority. The other term in a binary opposition is, is derogated, debased, trivialized. And given that Derrida claims language is a function of power, it implies po uh, power relations. He asks, like any intelligent critical theorist would, why do European languages follow such rigorously strict patterns without much variation throughout the course of history? Now, if we look at the social, political, cultural, and economic institutions of European civilization, dating back to the year 1492, we'll see, just as Derrida does, a certain degree of homogeneity or stability. Uh, their Social and political systems are patriarchal. Capitalism is progressively developing. The bourgeoisie is progressively becoming the dominant political class as Europe has moved away from feudalism or the feudalist economic system. European nations, facilitated by advances in seafaring technology, are coming into intimate contact with the wider world, Africa, Asia. In the Americas. Now, if one looks at the cultural productions or texts in the broadest sense that become hegemonic or dominant throughout this broad span of historical time, dating back to 1492, we may see that they reflect a pattern one might define as ideological. That is, the language they deploy can be said to represent the economic and political interests of the ruling class. We might say that the binary either or logic of the language Derrida analyzes does not represent fully or faithfully the way things actually are or the natural order of things, right? Rather, it points to the ruling class's concepts of the way things are, or ought to, or are supposed to be. Now, the reasons, and there are many, 
why the binary view of the world holds sway over alternative views are complex. Uh, why do women internalize patriarchal ideology and unconsciously subject themselves to a view of reality that limits their capacity to determine and meaningfully create their own destinies? Why do the colonized accept the tenets and implicit assumptions of colonialist discourse? a system of meaning and signification that represents them as primitive, irrational, hypersexual, and emotional, uh, creatures of instinct like animals, etc., etc., etc. Why does the patriarchal, Eurocentric, bourgeois, colonialist point of view predominate over alternative viewpoints throughout this long span of history dating back to 1492. These are the sorts of questions that deconstruction and post-colonial theory or post-colonialism or post-colonial criticism take up. A simple answer to these questions would look something like the following. The dominant point of view is explained by the fact that a very narrow portion of the global population owns the means of production and, as a consequence, is able to extract value from the labor power of the masses or the proletariat, both in their homeland and abroad. Moreover, through a course throughout the course of history, value, again in the Marxist sense, is invested in the superstructure, including the sphere of intellectual or cultural production. That said, the experiences, ideas, values, and points of view of, of women, the proletariat, slaves, and indigenous peoples are marginalized by an economic system which gives rise to a system of representation or discourse that deprives them of a voice through which they might effectively contest it. When I say deprives them, I mean this generally speaking, not all together. Okay? Um, however, as Martin Luther King says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And again, this is kind of a Marxist notion, uh, or at least it uh, um, uh, seems to uh, indicate a Marxist view of the way that history operates, which is, say, through class conflict. Okay? Uh, Post-colonialists look back through history and study the social, political, and cultural movements of colonized peoples and see ample evidence that in spite of the resourcefulness, ingenuity, and powers of the bourgeoisie, there are indeed manifold, again, numerous and varied ways to resist oppression and injustice. To take just one example from many others, literature is one powerful medium of resistance to ideology. Cultural colonization, colonialist discourse, universalism, and Eurocentrism. As Tyson mentions, canonical counter discourse is both a literary or cultural and a political phenomenon. To use a concrete example, which Tyson does in her book, works of literature like Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart and Jean Reese's Why Sargasso Sea, which we've already read together, uh, do perform cultural and political work. In a very modest, albeit potentially powerful way, both works arguably work and do a lot of work to challenge, deconstruct, and undermine sexist and racist ideology by exposing it as false, narrow-minded, and specious. Note how, for example, powerful characters like Christophine and Antoinette managed to unsettle Rochester's beliefs in the superiority of English culture, which is the bedrock of his identity. Notice how his views of gender and race are effectively satirized as myopic or provincial, limited and destructive, and, and even self-destructive for that matter. Uh, that is more a reflection of his narcissism, his infantile desire for mastery and control, his mercenary tendencies, 
uh, or economic interests than a representation of uh, the Lacanian real, a concept that we didn't talk about uh, at length this semester, but it's located in, in Tyson uh, and worth referring to, uh, especially if you're curious about the, uh, um, how it is that uh, psychoanalytic theory or Lacanian psychoanalytic theory may come to bear on uh, uh, the work that, that post-colonial critics and theorists do with literature. Uh, so the Lacanian real refers to the world that exceeds ideology in its fullness, richness, and complexity. Um, so that said, post-colonial literary theory studies texts that attempt to critique, expose, and thereby undermine colonialist discourse so that human beings can begin to see a glimmer of the possibility of a world that is not mindlessly conformed with desires, interests, and ideas, and points of view of the powerful few. You know, literature, in as much as it is bold enough to imagine a new trajectory of world history, encourages us to work uh, towards a world that is truly post-colonial, not only in the political sense, uh, but in the cultural and economic sense as well.